We've come to understand that movies can make an incredible impact on culture. So can songs, plays, every aspect of culture. And one area that investors are increasingly leaning into is the concept of investing in movies. And it's a topic that, candidly, I don't know a lot about, but an increasing number of our community and our network are really looking into it heavily. Uh, when you think about the impact that Imagine has made or Woodlawn, it's something that I think that increasingly we need to look at. And yet, it's kind of a black box. A lot of people don't understand how to invest in movies. So in this segment, we're going to look at it a bit more. And we're really, really pleased and really honored to have John Irwin with us now to talk to us a little bit about his experience as a movie producer and then also what it looks like to invest in movies and how you can go about it. As an investor, if you're looking in entertainment, um, I love one of our original investors, Raymond. He's a wonderful friend in Dallas, Texas. And uh, he said, you know, I, I, didn't, I don't invest in movies. I invest in two kids from Alabama. I've always appreciated that about him. But there is something to um, invest in people, you know. And, uh, and so I think if you're looking at entertainment, um, invest in people that you believe in and stories that you believe in. Um, and ultimately voices that you want to see developed. Uh, I think that, it, you know, just know that again, this should come out of an alternative side of your portfolio. This should be money that you're not afraid to lose. Um, the deal should be structured, uh, in your, on, you know, in your favor in the event, uh, that you win for that reason, because it is a, it is a incredibly, I love the industry that we get to work in because it is like brutally competitive. It's like winner take all. And you have to embrace that you can be a bare fisted capitalist and a Christian all at the same time, you know, and it's, uh, it's fun to win, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and we enjoy winning. But I think that when you look at this space, you know, you should, again, look at it coming out of the alternative side of your portfolio. Uh, you should look at it as a means of influence and a means of developing talent and voices. Um, you do need capital. Uh, a friend of mine wrote a book called Patron, and the idea that every great move of God is paired with a patron. And uh, capital is the means of, of, of influencing in this space. Um, but you just need to do it smart, smartly. And, uh, and I would say just understand that you need to hear a plan. Here's some things that I would want to hear if I was taking a pitch from a filmmaker. First of all, I would want to, to um, hear a pitch from a filmmaker who also has a lot of knowledge about we don't make films. We make films for people. And so you need to hear a filmmaker that has a, an extreme level. I would be listening for a sense of empathy and a, and a great sense of knowledge on who the consumer is and who the film is for. A film needs to be made for a group. And Meyer Gottlieb, who ran Samuel Goldwyn for many years, he, he taught me this great thing. He said, I don't ever ask, is this a good or a great film? I ask, is this a great film for a group of people? How large is that group? And do I know how to get to them? You know, and so you need, I would be listening for, oh, I have, instead of like, a lot of what happens is, I'm so passionate about this story and stuff like that. It's like, this is the film. And I really think this is the audience for the film. And let me tell you about the audience. I can tell you who the core consumer is for a faith-based film down to their age, uh, uh, where they live, how much their home is worth, um, you know, what is in their shopping cart when they buy the product at, uh, at uh, um, when they buy a physical spinning DVD, which they still do at Walmart, as opposed to like La La Land or something else. And so there just should be an extreme level. I just am a huge believer in extreme empathy. Uh, when it comes to, to products. And so you should be listening for someone who has a relationship with an audience and has a knowledge of what that audience wants and is making a film for an audience and has some sort of a reasonable plan that, um, has, uh, uh, that has some sort of a logic of how they're going to not only make the film, but distribute and release the film and market the film specifically. I think that there's a horrible fault sum in entertainment, and typically this is why most people lose films is because uh, lose money in films is because they're they're really it's a it's a producer that's really only thinking about getting the film made, and that's a it's a Herculean task. It's so hard to make a film, but as a filmmaker, you climb that mountain, and then the fog clears, and you realize there's a mountain twice as tall ahead of you that you weren't prepared to climb, and that's marketing and distribution. So, I would look for a holistic plan. Um, to not only make the product, but take the product to the consumer, 
that makes sense. I do like this whole Ray Dalio trick um, called the believability test in his company, uh, which he wants to create a culture where the best idea wins. Everybody has a voice, but opinions are weighted and believable when someone who's speaking has accomplished the thing in question uh, more than three times successfully and has a great logic of cause and effect to back up their opinion. It just makes sense. I, I would look for that. And then I would just know that the common problem, and here's a great question I would ask. The common problem in film is that there's another category of money called prints and advertising, which is the money required to release a film nationally. So like for instance, um, I can only imagine it costs $7 million to make. Our initial P&A budget was 13 and a half million. And then we scaled up to 19 million by the end. It's, a, it's very expensive to release a film nationally. So in, in the typical, what I would call unfair system, not the studio system, but the acquisition system, the independent model, that money sits on top of the equity. And I would ask them, what's your plan for um, the P&A? And, you know, just start opening that up as a discussion. Uh, I think that'll show you're sophisticated, but also show that you know how typically um, investors lose money. Um, and then the creative arts, you know, it's all about, it's all about empowering the right people and it's all about talent. It's all about, you know, working with artists is very um, strenuous at times. <laughs> We're a complicated bunch. And so sometimes, um, you know, greatness is not going to be obvious. And so a lot of times what I do is I want to source down to the person doing the thing and make sure that person is qualified and present. Um, oftentimes they're not. A lot of times you have sort of, it's sort of like you get pitches that are almost like, it would be like a pitch of like, hey, I just hired Michael Jordan's physical trainer. Let's go make a basketball team. Well, it's, you need Michael Jordan. And so a lot of times you have like executives or business people, but the, the creative force needed to do the thing is not present in the deal. So I always try to like hunt down to the bottom is, is there talent involved in this deal? You know, because it takes talent to, uh, to create great art. And so I would look for that. I would look for a filmmaker that you really believe in. I do think overall um, it's a worthy thing to invest in the entertainment sector. I think, um, you know, we should embrace that methodology of Caleb in the Bible when he said, give me this mountain, you know, uh, to, um, to Joshua. And I think we should look at that, uh, you know, hill with the Hollywood sign on it with that same mantra of like, God, give us this. Um, we want our voice back uh, culturally. Um, I just think you need to be smart about it and you need to be educated about it. And I just believe in giving, I think we keep uh, repeating each other's mistakes because we're not sharing information. And I think that the way out of this uh, is to, is to share information. Um, you know, we should be encouraged that the, 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 the ability to influence the world, um, through entertainment has never been more accessible. Um, I do defy the evil Hollywood agenda methodology. I don't believe in it. And, uh, uh, I think it's, it, it's our, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was talking after doing the Lionsgate deal. Uh, Lionsgate is um, uh, the newest of the major studios, but they did like the Hunger Games and La La Land and uh, the John Wick films. And uh, Joe's the chairman of the Ocean Picture Group at Lionsgate. Wonderful guy, great mentor, great friend, and um, really smart guy. And uh, shortly after we did the deal, um, he said... Uh, Hey, John, let me ask you a question because you're like the only Christian I know. There's this book that he had just come in and, and retaken over the Motion Picture Group. Uh, and um, he said, there's this book that's floating around that was optioned sort of before my time, but there's some momentum for it. And I just was wondering, it's called um, Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. I'm sorry, Jesus of Nazareth. Um, would, you know, you're the only Christian I know. Would Christians like that? Thank God I'd read it like a couple times. I said, uh, the basic premise of Zealot is that Jesus was just a rebel leader that Rome crucified, like a Braveheart character, and all of the divinity stuff in Christianity was just added on later, and it's not real. So no, Christians wouldn't like it. And uh, But I was like, how do I explain this to you in words you can understand, man? And I'm like, uh, that would be like if I brought you a pitch for Harry Potter under the basic premise that magic wasn't real. 
you'd have a kid running around London crazy with a stick. The fans would hate it. And uh, that's what this is. You're taking, you're taking the force out of Star Wars. You're taking magic out of the story. You're taking out what the fans want out of the story. Uh, that's what this is. And I said, look, I think my audience will be wrapped around this building with pitchforks and torches. I'll go talk to them, but I don't think they'll listen. They're going to burn your house down, man. And um, he laughed and he said, uh, uh, I get it. We, we won't do that. <laughs> and I said, if you want to know what I think we should do, I think you should do like a trilogy on the apostles, like a character drama, like a band of brothers type thing um, on a generation that literally, uh, you know, this, this family, this group of guys that shaped, shaped the world as we know it today. Um, in one generation, completely under-equipped. That's what I would do. I'd do a trilogy called Apostles. He's like, okay. I'm like, what? He's like, let's do that. I'm like, well, that's a huge, that's a massive, that's a big, and I'm like, just give me, give me that. he's like, that sounds great. Let's go do it. And so that's one of the things that we're working on and developed, uh, developing it's going to happen. Uh, my point is, let's say I wasn't in the room. Joe doesn't know. Let's say Zealot gets made. And let's say every Christian conservative blog out there is like the evil Hollywood agenda. It wasn't an evil agenda. It was a lack of knowledge because there's no one in his life representing our audience. It's our fault. We're not in the room. And uh, to know that I'm the only, and it's funny, we did the deal at Lionsgate. I came, uh, felt, uh, John Feldheimer is the CEO of Lionsgate. And he's a great guy and, and he's a good friend. And when he came out, um, did the deal, came out of his office. One of the heads of the departments uh, waved me over. He's like, get over here, get over here. And I'm like, um, hi, I'm John. He told me his name. And, uh, and he said, I just want you to know I'm a Christian and I'm here and there's a few of us and we're really glad you're here. You know, and, uh, <laughs> and I laughed and I said, man, I think this is like, you can come out about it. You know, they, they, I came in through the front door. They're paying me a lot of money to be here. And, uh, and this is your moment. You can, you can, you know, so I, I think that there's, um, just a complete lack of representation. And again, I think, I think I love that, uh, or Schultz quotes, we, we're leaders, which we means we forfeited the right, uh, to make excuses. I just think as Christians, we have to take on the mantra. We have to stop blaming and we have to engage and we're not, uh, in the game in Hollywood. That is our fault. There was a time when we were, I don't know why we're not today but we've abandoned the cultural playing field and we're suffering the consequences. And I think the only way to get to a generation is to get back in the game. So we have to start thinking differently uh, about, about the nature of the problem when it comes to entertainment, because I think we're in this perpetual victim mindset and we're getting nowhere with that mindset. And, uh, and I think that mindset, you know, we all have, we all have the right to our own opinions, but we do not all have the right to our own set of facts. You know, there's one set of facts and the facts don't, uh, I'm deep inside the industry. The facts don't line up with our opinions on the issue of the evil Hollywood agenda. It's our fault. And if it's our fault, it's ours to fix. And I just think that we need to get in the game and we need to trailblaze a little bit and, and get some paths where a lot of other uh, Christians can follow us. I just think that there's enormous talent emerging and we need to give them a voice and we need to give them a voice as quickly as we can. The only way to do that is to make, is, is to be smart and, and, and to be smart, uh, not artists, to be smart entrepreneurs and, uh, and to do smart investments and to learn and to, and to embrace the idea that the entertainment value of the product, the success of the product in the marketplace is as important as the message we're putting into it uh, because that's the way we make this scalable and sustainable over a long haul. <laughs>